Okay, let's do a little truss problem. So we've got a truss ABCD. It is supported by PIN pin connections at A and C. This gives me an opportunity to talk about a frequent misunderstanding from statics. And here's how this breaks down. I know I got to get back to here, but let me just pause for just a second and go on a tangent. I'll be quick, I promise. Each one of these PIN pins, A, B, C, and D, right? These are all PIN pins. There's only two of them that are actually pinned, P-I-N-N-E-D, to this plane of fixity. See, this PIN pin C has a gusset plate or a plate attached to it. That plate, in turn, is fixed uh, to that, you know, this symbol right here, which means that plane can't move around in space, right? Same thing over here at A, right? So I have a PIN pin that is P-I-N-N-E-D, pinned to this plane of fixity. In other words, joint A cannot move, joint C cannot move, joints B and D can move around in space, and they will. Okay, so let me show you kind of how that would work. If I were just to kind of sketch over, let's see, what's the best way for me to do this? Let's do it this way. I'm going to grab part of this truss, namely this part. And just temporarily, I'm going to do edit, copy, merged, edit, paste. And I'm just going to put it right here. Now. I'm going to imagine that this part of the truss is rigid or that this triangular piece is kind of acting as a body. That's not too dissimilar to how this truss would actually work, but it would pivot about C like this. In other words, let me actually just put that in context. I'll turn the volume down on that a little bit and I'll turn the volume down on this quite a bit so we can kind of see through it. Okay, so what is happening is, is that wrong layer, there we go. Thank you for bearing with me, you're awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna keep node C completely attached to that P-I-N-N-E-D plane right there, okay? And that whole truss is gonna tend to rotate in that way. Now, there are other stuff that's going there's other stuff going on. So this member's actually gonna get a little bit shorter, kind of like this. Uh, this member's gonna elongate a little bit like this, okay? Um, this element here is in compression, so that one's gonna get just a little bit shorter. A is staying put here, right? We know that because it's attached to the plane of fixity. To kind of emphasize those a little bit. And then, right, this member just kind of stretches out and that one's gonna be going into tension. So you see how I'm visualizing the way that this particular truss, put this one down here, uh, right there, thank you, how this particular truss in the deformed geometry, each member that is subjected to tension or to compression will elongate or it will shorten, but also those nodes are moving around in space. The only nodes that do not move are the ones that are P-I-N-N-E-D pinned to a plane of fixity turn up the volume there just a little bit. One more little note and then I'll get these layers out of here and we'll kind of focus more on the problem. In other words, node B moved to the right and it moved down. So it translated from one point to another. The translation of node A is zero. The translation of node C is zero. Node D translated from this undeformed shape. It moved in the X direction that way it moved or translated in the y direction that way. So these pieces are moving around in shape to create this new geometry. All right, let's just turn these off, get them out of here, put that one back up, new layer, good. Okay, 
All right, back to business. So we've got this truss. Um, the load has been applied here. It's equal to 10 kips or 10 kilopounds, 10,000 pounds. All members are made of A36 steel. So, you know, whenever you know a material specification, you can look that material up in the appropriate tables and find out uh, what the material properties are of that particular steel alloy. Um, we're also given some information that each member's cross-sectional area is equal to one inch squared, to one inch squared. And we're asked to find what is the average normal strain, what is the average normal strain in the material at plane EE. Plane EE is obviously shown here. Okay, and we know the definition of strain is deformation per length. The, so we want to figure out like in member AB, how much deformation is happening. That's what gets plugged in here. What is the length of AB that gets plugged in here? And we know that already. So L is equal to 15 feet. That is given in the problem. All right, I'm going to do my section cut and watch this part carefully. Usually when I assign this problem to static students or to students in mechanics of materials, they usually can solve it, but they usually are not solving it efficiently or quickly. Many problems are far simpler than students realize. All right, so what I'm gonna do is take this much of the structure, I'm gonna do a paste in order to create a free body diagram. Now, to put my free body in equilibrium, what do I need to do? I need all of my applied loads. Check, got it. I need all of my reaction forces. So I need reactions at C, because that one is P-I-N-N-E-D, can't move, therefore develops reactions. I'm going to draw these in an arbitrary direction, OK? I'm going to draw the horizontal one to the left. I'm going to draw the vertical one down. Now, neither one of those directions are actually actually correct. They're all drawn. They're both drawn in the wrong direction. I'm just drawing them there and drawing them in those directions in particular to have a nice clean drawing. So I'm just going to assume incorrectly that the, the vertical reaction is going down. I'm going to assume incorrectly that the horizontal reaction is going to the left. It doesn't really matter. So as long as I'm consistent, I can assume anything I want on the drawing. Okay, so remember the three things we need for free bodies. We need the external applied load, got it. We need reactions, reactions. So we've got those in our free body, that part is done. And the third thing is internal forces and moments every time that you slice or cut through the material. So we've sliced through the, sol the solid material here. This is our theoretical cutting plane. And that means we need to show things like, what is the normal force in that plane? What is the shearing force in that plane? What is the bending moment in that plane? If you remember from statics that two force members are defined as ones that are pin connected both ends and no applied loads along the way, you should be able to identify that in this truss, member AB, as well as all of the other elements, that they are all two force members, which I'll abbreviate 2FM. Another way to think about this, two force member is a term that not all statics professors use. You could also say that these are axial members or members loaded solely in axial tension or compression. Now, one characteristic of those type of members is that they do not carry an internal shear force. They do not carry an internal shear force or an internal bending moment. So we could simplify this free body and just put my normal force in plane EE. I'll just draw it in the positive direction by default. If you were drawing this free body by hand and didn't have the luxury of using Autodesk Sketchbook or another similar program, you would want to show that EE is a cut plane, 
by making our little standard symbol for that. I'll zoom in to make sure you can see it. It essentially looks like a straight line coming down, a little squiggle saying that we're slicing through the member. So the member's continuous beyond the scope of this drawing, and then a straight line going down. That's the symbol for doing that. Okie doke. We got the three things. Our free body diagram is ready to go. And now we have at our disposal all of the equations of equilibrium. So summation of forces x direction equals zero, summation of forces y direction equals zero, summation of moments about any z axis, the ones coming out of the screen towards you, the axis that is perpendicular to the screen, um, those are all equal to zero as well. So this is our system in static equilibrium. Do you see a fast and easy equation given these options, these tools, these equations of equilibrium? Do you see a fast and easy way to solve for this one? I mean, horizontal force summation would be fantastic if we knew what this was, but we didn't solve that yet. Is there a moment summation we could use? And the answer is yes, there is. Let's sum moments about C. If I sum moments about C, these vectors are coincident to C and won't generate a moment. The only vectors in the system that generate a moment are tendency to rotate. Tendency for this, let me, let me be a little more explicit, okay? So these moment summations are a tendency of the body to rotate about an axis that is coincident to a point, in this case, um, point C. And the only ones that are going to enter our formulation are the 10 kip vector and our unknown. We only got one unknown, so we can solve this right away. Let's go ahead and do it. Summation of moments about the Z axis that is coincident to point C is equal to zero. And if I ever forget to put X and Y on a 2D planar problem like this, you can always assume that it is in kind of this conventional depiction unless I you know, make a big deal out of it and specifically say otherwise. All right, term one, 10 kips, distance, 10 feet, positive or negative, negative. Next term, our unknown in the normal force at plane EE, distance perpendicular between the line of action of that vector and point C. Well, I'm looking for this one right here. Let me switch my colors up. I'm going to get blue. I'm looking for this distance right here. And I can clue in to this 45 degree triangle. So I've got a 45 degree triangle like that, and I know the base is 10, so I know the height is 10 too. So that distance is also 10 feet. We'll plug that into the equation, 10 feet, and we need a sign for that rotation that is tend tending to rotate the body counterclockwise or positive. If you're doing the 3D formulation with the right hand rule, you could say it's positive because thumbs up negative thumbs down, and um, set that equal to zero. And we can very, very quickly determine that since that distance term of 10 feet is the same for both of these moment components, that the normal force in plane EE is equal to 10 kips. I got a positive sign from this little operation. And all that tells me is that the direction that I assumed was correct. I assumed tension arrow pointing away from the body in my free body diagram. My positive sign confirmed that. So to be emphatic about the sign, I would choose to express it in this way, 10 kips of tension. All right. I think it took a lot of explanation, but it didn't take much math or much formulation to, to reach that conclusion. All right, but all that we did, we figured out the normal force in that member, 10 kips. And at this point, we're done with the statics. We're ready to go into um, mechanics of materials principles. So let's just kind of clean this up. 
And now we know that our normal force is 10 kips of tension. Our area is given as one inch squared. If you look up the properties for A36 steel, you're gonna get a modulus of elasticity of 29,000 KSI. Our original length of member AB is 15 feet. And I think that's all we need to do this. All right, so let's figure out what our average normal strain is. Strain is defined as, um, what I'm gonna do is use this equation for modulus of elasticity. So that's defined as stress over strain, a ratio. And so I can rewrite that simple equation as strain is equal to stress divided by the modulus. Okay, so stress divided by the modulus. Now I'm going to use my stress equation, n over a, plug that in as well. So n over a e. And I think I'm ready to plug and chug. So um, my internal normal force, that's 10 kips, cross-sectional area, one inch squared, modulus of elasticity, 29,000. KSI is kips per inch squared. So I'm going to toss that up in the numerator as so. Okay. My kips cancel out. My inches squared cancel out. Is that alarming? Nope, because I'm trying to compute a strain. And the units of strain are unitless. Calculator time, 10 divided by 29,000, best expressed in decimal form like this, or rather engineering notation form, 345 E minus six. If you left it unitless, it wouldn't be marked wrong, but the best way to communicate this, to be emphatic about your understanding about the sign, is to do inches per inch. It is positive since member AB is in tension. I'll put a little box around that since it is the final answer to the problem. Okay, so note that when you're asked to compute something like average normal strain, you know, when we did that in, in a prior unit, you know, we just knew this one definition, deformation over length, but we don't know the deformation yet anyway. We do know this new modulus of elasticity. The modulus of elasticity tells us the ratio of stress to strain. Actually, I should probably box this one. The ratio of stress to strain within the linearly elastic range of the material. Through this course, we will always assume that our calculations occur within the linearly elastic range of the material unless specifically indicated otherwise. So we have no reason, reason to believe that we have exceeded the yield stress. Um, if you wanted to check that, and honestly, in a more practical engineering perspective, that's probably an important thing to do. So I'll just kind of run through it quickly. We would just want to do stress equals force over area equals 10 kips over one inch squared equals 10 KSI. And that actual stress is less than the yield stress of A36 steel. That's 36 KSI. And that's how you know definitively this problem is loading the truss, or at least that member, within the linearly elastic range of the material. I hope this helped you both as a statics review and then also uh, in terms of some new mechanics of material concepts. Thanks for listening.